Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another week of Ask Pastor Sunday Show. Thank you very much for tuning in. We are starting our session and we will be waiting for you to come and for you to ask your, your questions to us. And welcome, Pastor. Thank you. I think they should invite their friends, uh, who, whoever they are. Let them send the link and the share, that share with their friends right now so that uh, as many as they share with their friends, so many... Uh, the more people have the opportunity to watch. Yes, of course. So please uh, share this video and the broadcast with your friends. If you're watching us on Facebook, then just go um, to your share button and click it. So you will share with all your newsfeed, with all of your friends. And also you can send the message directly to your friends. And if you're watching us on Periscope, you can also share the broadcast in the settings of the broadcast of the live broadcast that you're watching and those of you on youtube you can also send the link to your friends directly and again for those of you who are watching us through periscope or facebook for the higher quality as usually you can tune in on faith on youtube on pastor pastor's official channel so just go to the video that we've placed the video the link to the video right in the name of this broadcast whether you're on facebook and also right below the video so you won't miss the link just go there and be ready to ask your questions because we are ready to receive them and pastor is ready to answer them right sir yes ma'am okay so the first question is we we're starting right away First of all, Pastor, um, we've been talking a lot about uh, different issues, uh, such as in politics, in the society, such as homosexuality. And one of the questions that we receive is basically how to make kingdom topics more dominant today instead of the topics promoted by the society, such as homosexuality, adultery, stealing, and fornication. Hmm. For you to make the kingdom uh, subjects more dominant, either in a, in the church or in our um, programs or in the society, we need to actually engage the society and the challenges and the problems of the society with kingdom answers. Mm -hmm. So the only way for you to shine the light brightest is when you go to where darkness is. If, for example, if I have a matchbox and I, uh, you know, put on the match mm -hmm. right here where there is a lot of light, I will not see the impact or the effect of that mm -hmm. light coming from that match. Mm -hmm. But if I go to a place where there is utter darkness, mm -hmm. the contrast will bring out the beauty and the strength and the energy of that light. So if we really want the kingdom to be more prominent in any society, it is not by talking about it the more that we do it. The best way to do it is to go and engage darkness, mm -hmm. engage things that are wrong in the society with kingdom answers and solutions. So when we come with light, then we shine the brightest in darkness, not where things are okay. So that's why the kingdom must never be limited to the four walls of the church, because there you already have the light. And if you stay in there as well, you know, you're not bringing much benefit to too many people. One of the things that I've recently read was actually by American pastor claiming that if you're successful, for example, in sports or you're a successful singer, outside of the church but you are not serving inside of the church that means that you are irrelevant to the work of the christ and you're irrelevant to the body of the christ and you will not be almost that you will not be accepted by god do you agree with that statement yes if the person is only pursuing uh personal and you know selfish agenda out there in the world yes that could be true Mm -hmm. But so what I would rather recommend to that person who is successful outside is for him or her to be taught and be well taught in secrets or principles of releasing the kingdom of God mm -hmm. wherever he or she is successful already. So we must be able to 
teach these believers that are working or successful outside of the church on how to impose the kingdom of God and release the principles of the kingdom of God out there where they are working. Because if they are just working and they are just pursuing worldly goals and worldly ambitions and they are not in a parallel way mm -hmm. releasing the kingdom of God, yes, that pastor could be right. Mm -hmm. But if they are there pursuing God's agenda, what matters is whose agenda are these people pursuing? If it's only a personal agenda, selfish agenda, or worldly goals, then that's tragic. That's tragic. But if they are actually in the world to be successful for him, mm -hmm. to make his name sound louder, and to make his light shine brightest, then that is, uh, that's the way to go. What if the person he's pursuing the kingdom of God outside of the church in his sphere, but he doesn't have enough time to serve at the church? Doesn't mean that he is not a good Christian? Uh, in the real sense, um, I personally believe that most people who serve in the church are only doing housekeeping job. Mm -hmm. It is uh, it's just like you are living in your house and you are keeping it clean. That's not your work. It's not mm -hmm. your job. Mm -hmm. So for you to really serve God, you need to go to, just like for you to work or get a job, you need to go outside and work somewhere. The same way, if you are a believer, I don't think that singing in the choir or just being in the usher department uh, is, is, is ministry or is service to God as such. That's just keeping your house in order. To, for you to really serve God, you've got to go outside to the four walls of the earth. I mean, of the, outside the four walls of the church. You've got to go to a sphere of life where you identify your gifts and God's ability, uh, God's abilities in you, and whereby you use those abilities and those gifts to now influence the world to know the master. Mm -hmm. That is actually the purpose. So every Christian is supposed to be serving outside of the church, more, uh, apart from those who are in the fivefold ministry. So those in the fivefold ministry, yes, their calling is might be within the four mm -hmm. walls, but every other Christian is supposed to be serving in the in the in the in the in the world. What about those who belong, for example, to the worship bands and they were hired by the church? to do, it's their job to do the worship and to lead the worship. That is not ministry yet. That just, you know, helping the church out. That's in keeping. That's still in mm -hmm. keeping service. But they still have to go and bring influence. The idea is that every ministry that we have should be influencing people to know God better, to, for them to know Christ as their personal, as pe mm -hmm. people's personal uh, Lord and Savior. So whatever you are doing to make them discover God, uh, that is your ministry. You could do that also in the church, but not for so many people. The ninety-eight percent of Christians are supposed to be in the world, engaging the world, and letting the world live by the principles of the kingdom of God. He said, "Go ye." Mm -hmm. So he doesn't. He didn't say, "Stay ye in the church or sit ye in the mm -hmm. church." Go ye therefore to the ends of the earth and make disciples there in the world, not in the church. So we are supposed to be making disciples, not in the church, but in the world. How do we do make this happen? By teaching them to observe. So as a believer, I'm supposed to teach the world to observe everything that Christ has taught me. So mm -hmm. to observe the values of the kingdom, the kingdom principle, principles of the kingdom, that will to change the mindset and the uh, modi operandi of people outside that I have encounter with. So I'm supposed to reflect Christ so strongly that people want to live by the standard and that I've set. So it does not mean that they necessarily want to come to my church, but it just means that they want to change their lifestyle and they want to begin to practice the rules and principles that Christ brought to the earth. Okay, what about practical implementation of what you just said? For example, I'm working in the office. Should I go there and claim that I'm a Christian? And then should I prophesy to them? Should I pray over them? Should I preach? Probably on something that I've heard on Sunday services. How, how do I become influential? It's very simple. The way to become influential as a believer outside in the world is to be an example to become a light, to become a salt. How do you do that? You must do your work in such a way that you excel mm -hmm. in doing whatever you're doing one way or the other. Either you excel in 
um, in interacting or in relationship in relating with people so much that people see something so bright in you that they are attracted to you they want to talk to you to you so that way you have been able to draw them to yourselves and then to yourself and then you could further your discussion with them about Christ afterwards mm -hmm. or you are doing your work so well that the quality of your service and the diligence by which you execute it is uh, impresses whoever you are interacting with so you must excel one way or the other is by doing something so good mm -hmm. that people want to you, the people want to pay attention to you, people mm. notice you, people take note of you, then that is how you reveal to them. Then you must find an instrument that you use to reveal to them that actually the reason I'm so good, they, so you are serving mm. them so well so that they will discover the Christ in you and then you'll be able to open a discussion to them. So the best way to open a discussion to people is that you already impress them by your gifts, by your talents, by your diligence, by your, you know, by, by, by your excellence, by whatever you do. So that is the best way. You, you provoke, you trigger the relationship, the talk, by the excellence execution of your service. Mm -hmm. Excellent execution of your service. That's a good statement. Um, what about those who claim that through church, you are more influential, like you can go out with your, for example, home group or with your ministry, you can go out, you can, again, preach to people on the streets and you will gather much more people than in that personal interaction. Do you believe in personal interactions rather than the general evangelization on the streets? Yeah, statistics don't lie. And statistics say that the greatest amount of people who come to church and remain in the church, about 90% are always people who come through personal invitation. So uh, when you invite people personally, interact with them personally, that is the amount of people, the, the largest amount of people that are in the church even now. Mm -hmm. Even though we are, we are not against um, evangelism and crusades, you can still do that, but normally, uh, you know, the most effective way is when Christians interact and become light and soft wherever they are. Mm -hmm. What about Christians? We have statistics, even in our church, we have statistics of those who repented, who came, became the, um, the members of our church, um, about the people who came and they received their salvation here. How do you count them, meaning that should they pray and then you will count them as a person who had entered the church or who had received the salvation, what is the statistical measurement? What kind of statistical measurement do you use? Yeah, in our church we just use home groups. People who are part of the home group system, people come to church on Sunday and then still go to home group. Those are just the people we count right now. We don't count people who just got saved. Uh, we can count them, but we don't regard them as members of the church or part of the church. The people we regard as members of the church are people who are active both in the church and the home group system. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. And in the beginning of the year, you, uh, we started our Q&A session at the History Makers training here with the students, international students who came to, to see you for three days. And one of the questions that was like, that draw everybody's attention and like everybody were commenting and asking you, and now the discussion is still going on. One of the questions was, whether Jesus is coming back soon or not. Could you please repeat your, uh, your statement and why do you believe whether he is coming back soon or he is not? I already said that, I guess. Yes. So and let them wash it. Yes, and one of the questions that, um, that were asked after people watched your video, they say that you do not understand Bible in the essence that like we have the examples, everything just shows the examples that Jesus is coming back soon since the, the, thi the horrifying things that are going on in our world. So is he coming back? Well, it's not my job to convince them otherwise. <coughs> uh, I, told, I, told, I shared what I believe and they have the right to, share, to believe what they want to believe and thank God for that. That's why we are all individuals free, individuals to have our own opinion. So my job is not to change people's mind. I just share what I believe. And what I believe is that Jesus is not coming back in the next 10 years, or uh, maybe even in the next 20 or 30 years, for sure, I know that. And the only way uh, for you to uh, know if I'm right or not is let's just keep on living. <laughs> and we'll see in the next 10 years if Jesus is coming back or not. And for me, it's a simple 
A simple thing. It's very easy to understand why Jesus will not come back. First of all, the Spirit of God lives in me. Even though Jesus, God told, uh, Jesus told us that nobody knows the time or the hour, I know of that scripture. And uh, I also know of the, script, of the fact that the disciples of Jesus Christ, even Paul, uh, were expecting Jesus to come back in their time. So people have, I understand people who are thinking Jesus is coming back tomorrow mm -hmm. because even the disciples were <laughs> expecting him to come back. But well, let me tell you that when that was, <laughs> that was 2,000 years ago. <laughs> And even back then, in the days of the uh, New Testament mm -hmm. and the Revelation, Jesus said, I am coming soon, I am coming soon, I am coming soon. Even back then, he had said, I am coming soon. Well, the earliest time that was, was <laughs> close to 2,000 years ago. Yeah, he's back. still to come. He's still here to come, <laughs> that's what I'm guessing. <laughs> because in God's mind, soon doesn't mean as soon as we think. And when he says he could come at any time, yes, he could actually come today. He mm -hmm. could come tomorrow, but because he has given us a guideline and he has given us uh, some things, some prerequisites to so his coming, he, and I'm not blind, and not just not blind, and the people who are saying he's coming tomorrow too are not blind, but I am also a thinking person. I mm -hmm. think. I use my mind. And I want to challenge everybody that is talking that Jesus is coming back next year to think and use their mind. And my, in my thinking, Jesus cannot come back next year. And he cannot even come back in the next 10 years for the simple reason that... Why? It, of course, everything is possible for mm -hmm. God. It, it, and it, that could happen, but most likely it will not happen. And the reason is because, I said it in, the, in my last interview, is that Jesus will not come back without giving, without saying... He said, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached as a witness to all nations. Let me tell you, there are nations and tribes that have not had the privilege of hearing mm -hmm. the gospel up to now. That has to be done if we are going to take Jesus seriously and if his word is true. That's number one. Number two, even in those places and those nations where we think that the gospel has been preached, the gospel of the kingdom has not been preached. Mm -hmm. The kingdom has to be introduced to even those places. Number three, I don't think Jesus is going to come back without giving the Arab, a old world of Arab nations, a chance. Uh, the Arab nation, I know that, yes, Jesus appears to some people, one, mm -hmm. one here, one there, in the Arab nations, and people get saved. But that's not the kind of chance he's going to give them. He's going to do some miraculous, miraculous things that the Arab nations will have a chance to be able to hear the gospel. One way or the other, something will happen. The wall of Islam will collapse, and the people will hear, the, will have the opportunity to hear the gospel. They will taste Christ, and they will choose him en masse. They will choose him, you know, in large numbers. And they, I don't think Jesus is going to come back without giving them a chance mm -hmm. to hear the gospel. Iran, I don't think too many people have that freedom to hear the gospel in Iran, even though we have a work there in Iran, mm -hmm. and people are getting saved or in large number, but not compared to the chance and opportunity. It's just like saying, 30 years ago, when I came to Ukraine, mm -hmm. I heard people back in Africa and America, everywhere in the Western world, everybody is using their own environment to think that the environment they have we have, like in Ukraine now, the way we are free or wherever people live, they are thinking that is what is available everywhere. Mm -hmm. And because they are living in UK or in Africa or in, 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 the, in the Western world where mm -hmm. there is freedom, they say, oh, the gospel is being preached to everybody. They don't know that there are still parts of the world where the gospel is totally prohibited. Mm -hmm. I was coming here 30 years ago and people said, Jesus was coming, Jesus was coming tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. That was 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And the whole world of communism was blocked. Even though there were Christians there who were suffering, but it would not come without bringing down that wall of communism. Mm -hmm. It would not come without giving the Soviet people the opportunity. If Jesus had come 30 years ago, your parents, your lineage, you, you wouldn't have been able to come to Christ. So he's giving the whole world of communism mm -hmm. that chance to receive the gospel in an open way, in, an, in a fair contest. Mm -hmm. So also in a fair way and a fair contest, he's going to open North Korea. Mm -hmm. to God so that they will be able to embrace the gospel as well. Even though there is freedom, some form of freedom in Cuba, but it's not as open 
as they will give he will give them it will, then god will not be feared he will give them the same openness that he has given us he will mm -hmm. give them the same chance and opportunity that he has given the west the same thing with iran the same thing with iraq the same thing with kuwait the same thing with saudi arabia the same thing with qatar the same thing with the middle east all these countries will be given an equal chance to hear the gospel mm -hmm. god is not a wicked god i know his heart i'm his friend and because i know his nature I can say he's not coming back in the next 10 years. Even though he says he could come back at any time, well, he could have come, come back 2,000 years ago as well, mm -hmm. or 1,000 years ago. Everybody said he was coming back, but yeah. it's just, just use your mind. Look at everything he says as supposed to happen. And the, the major one out of that is that the gospel will be preached to every nation. It will give everybody a chance. That's just how God is. Our oh. God is love. Our oh. God is kindness. Our God is generous. Our God is fear. He is a just God. He is going to give everybody a fair chance. So, but that's just one point. I could talk about different mm -hmm. other points mm -hmm. to prove. Just examining Matthew mm -hmm. 24, why Jesus said he's not. I mean, when, what will happen before he comes back? And I hear about the prophecies. I know people mm -hmm. right now. A whole uh, YouTube channel, mm -hmm. television station, a whole. Uh, ministry, all ministries all over America, all over the world, who are prophesying that, you know, this year, uh, you, uh, the whatever they call it, Antichrist was coming, mm -hmm. the sheep yes. is going to be yeah. placed, everything. I hear them as well, but they have their right. Thank God for them. That's their ministry. No, that's not my ministry. I am mm -hmm. getting ready to change the world. G Jesus said, get busy, occupy till I come. I am getting ready to get to china even though there are a lot of people getting saved in china but people you cannot say everybody in china has an equal opportunity to hear the gospel god is not going to you know he is not a wicked god he is going to give them a good chance to hear the gospel i'm i'm just being modest by saying 10 years is not coming in 20 years maybe it's not coming yet in 30 years it's not coming yet some of us will go to him before then <laughs> but he is not coming yet so I you know see. people might Say, I don't know the Bible. Uh, if they know the Bible better than me, well, I, want, I wonder where their fruits are. I want to see their fruits of what they have done with the Bible they know than mm. me. Yeah, yeah, I want to see their fruits. <laughs> but your words, they're actually giving all of us hope because you said that Jesus will give and God will give all of us equal opportunities to hear him. So I believe right after what you said, I believe that the same thing that had happened to the Soviet Union, um, to Ukraine, the country where we are in, the same thing will happen to North Korea. Can you believe it? I'm an African. And before the gospel came to Africa, Europeans used to say, yes, the God, Jesus is coming back tomorrow. Yes, come back. And the whole continent of Africa, that was five years, 500 years mm -hmm. ago, had not had the gospel. Everybody was believing. If people are going to the mountain, to the, to the desert, to mm -hmm. hide, to get ready, to go, go into the cave and saying God was coming. And they, I mean, the whole of Africa, they even hear the gospel. Even now, if as many as people that are getting saved in in, in, in India, that is not an equal chance yet. There is going to be greater door open in, 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 uh, in, in Jakarta, Indonesia, mm -hmm. in India. Everybody is going to have an equal chance before Jesus comes back. Amen. God is love. He cares for all those people. Even if they are Muslims, even if they are Buddhists, even, even if they are Hindus, whoever they are, He loves them so much. He does not want them to go to hell. He will not come back in a hurry until they have a chance. Mm. You need to know his heart mm -hmm. before you know that we just need to get busy. Don't let us bother ourselves about, is he coming today, is he coming tomorrow? He said, don't even bother about that. Just get busy. That's why he said, nobody will know when I'm coming back. Just get busy. He wants us to just, don't bother. We shouldn't be making calculations. Is it coming back today? Is it coming back tomorrow? He doesn't want us to bother ourselves about that. He just wants us, us to bother ourselves about getting the word, you know, to his feet and getting busy. Don't bother. Don't join those trails of talk. It's coming tomorrow. It's coming. Just get mm -hmm. ready every day. That is the idea of what Jesus was saying. Thank you. One of the questions is from Rufus. If a man of God is poor, does it mean that God did not call him? Well, you know, a lot of disciples were poor. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I know 
that a lot of charismatics and uh, you know, word of faith people believe that uh, Jesus was a millionaire or Jesus was rich or the disciples were rich. I don't think so. Maybe Jesus had some money, but he had to do miracles to get money sometimes. Mm -hmm. I remember that he couldn't pay for a tax at the time. He had to tell them to go get that fish and get some coins out of the mouth. So I think I have a little bit of doubt about the doctrine that is overemphasizing money, money, money. I think the money is not an indicator of how godly you are. Uh, you could be godly and not have money. Uh, some of the most godly people we have in the world today don't have money. And, uh, you know, I don't think money is a... Is, is, is a qualification, is a, you know, for you, or uh, it's an indicator, it's an indication of how godly you are. No, no, we should not equal material wealth or money to godliness at all. Mm -hmm. Another question is, one big controversy in the churches is the question, can you lose your salvation? Can you elaborate your thoughts, please? Yes, I believe we can lose our salvation. Mm -hmm. People can lose their salvation. And, um, but for you to lose your salvation, you've got to work hard on it. You've got to intentionally uh, do something for you to really lose it. For either you have to walk away from God consciously, or you have to stop serving Him, or at least you have to stop uh, pursuing Him, and you have to stop repenting of your sins, and you have to stop, um, you know, trying your best to please Him. But for people who are already asking that question mm -hmm. and who are pleasing God or who are just sinning or falling or having some mist making some mistakes or are imperfect and are afraid they are losing their salvation, they don't have anything to worry about. Because as long as your conscience, as their conscience is troubling them that they are sinning or they are about to lose their salvation, they are still concerned and worried about it, they are not about to lose it. People who lose their salvation are people who don't care about that salvation anymore. People who have walked away from God, they, they, don't, even, they don't even worry. They don't even care. They do everything they want to do. They've, you, you know, for you to lose your salvation, you've got to consciously walk away from Him. But if you just stumble or you sin or you, you know, and you still repent and you still pray and you still pursue God, it's not a question you should bother about. But yes, we can lose our salvation if we consciously walk mm -hmm. away from Him. Pastor, with all the killings and tragedies in our world, can pastors or servants... I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yes. before you go ahead, I just, what I'm trying to say about losing your salvation mm -hmm. is that you cannot... Okay, for example, if you... We finish this program now and you do something bad, I don't mm -hmm. know, you curse somebody or you... Uh, kick someone or anything you bad or you, you know, I don't know what you... And you die immediately. You don't lose salvation because of that. Because, you, you know, it's not an act of sin, one particular one that makes you to lose your salvation. It's relationship. So for you to lose your salvation, you've got to break that relationship with the Lord. Mm -hmm. You've got to walk out of that relationship. You've got to turn your back on that relationship. You know, it's not just one sin. It's an, you have to, you know, it's not even saying, it's just breaking the relationship that makes you to lose your relationship. So it means your if I'm in a relationship with God, yes. know, even though that I'm seeing like every single day on yes. some particular things yeah. like masturbation that we've yes. discussed before, but still I'm in relationship with yes. God, I'm saved. Yes. It is not sin that uh, determines if you are saved or not. It is sin that uh, it, is, um, it is grace that brought you to salvation, not works. Mm -hmm. So it is not your works that saved you. you, you know, it is not because you are not sinning that you got saved. Mm -hmm. You got saved because you are a sinner. And you got saved not because you stopped sinning. Mm -hmm. He said he loved us while we were yes sinners. Even when we were sinners, he said God saved. Jesus, that for example, Paul said, the good that I want to do, I don't always do it. But the sin and the bad things that I don't want to do, that's what I find myself doing most of the time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you are, if you are in name. Mm -hmm. So you could be in name and still stumble. You could be in name and still sin. You could be in name and still have, uh, what do you call it, the sin that draws us back in Genesis, in Hebrews chapter 12. It's happening now, which is great. That's the Russian mm -hmm. language. I don't remember the English word, but, but anyway, the sin that uh, brings us down, the mm -hmm. sin that we normally fall into all the time. You find that you fall into it all the time. If you repent all the time and you keep on pursuing God all the time, you don't lose your salvation. Mm -hmm. 
If it's that simple, all of us will be listening to that salvation every day. I will be collecting it back every day. <laughs> <laughs> thank God for God. Yes. <laughs> and thank God that God doesn't belong to our religious doctrines. Oh, you, yes. People could tell you anything they want to tell you. They could say, yes, everything you do, you lose okay. your salvation. Let them talk. Let them talk. God is in there with you. Just talk. God's mm. goodness and God's grace mm. is not as cheap as that. That should make you just to lose because you did something wrong. No, it, it will wait on you. 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 It will call on you. It will beg you. It will wait, wait, wait. Before you, unless you walk, walk, keep on walking away, 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 mm -hmm. away. Then you are out of his sight. Then he cannot help you. But then he will wait for you. He will wait for you. He, he is God. He never, yeah, he is God. He is God. Wow. Wow. He is love, sorry. He is love. Yes. What about the world? Um, I've started the question, like, we have so many killings in the world, and so many people, they are dying. Can pastors do something about it in spiritual terms? Like, can they <laughs> pray for it? Or should we actually go and do something about it? <laughs> Well, there are been, there were many catastrophes yes. and tragedies, killings, killings, everything. Yes, and um, yes, can pastors do something about I, it? That's, I'm trying to answer you. <laughs> I understood exactly what you meant. I'm trying to say, even when Jesus was here, mm -hmm. there were also same kind of occurrences. There were also killings. There were also wars. There were also tragedies. There were also catastrophes. Even while Jesus was here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And he couldn't do anything about it. He couldn't just stop all the wars. He couldn't just stop all the killings. Why? Is it that he didn't have enough power to do it? It's because we are adjusting the gospel. Our type of gospel that we are preaching today is we are trying to manipulate God. We are trying to you know, twist the arms of God and make him do something that he didn't promise us he was going to do. We, we just we think that since God is a miracle worker, he, should, mm -hmm. he has to do all that. No. God has an agenda in his operations. God know, knows that this earth is mm, legitimately given to the hands of man. And man has now legitimately invited Satan to join him on earth as the co-owner of, of planet earth. So here on earth, the source of all sorrow, pain, wars, killing is Satan. And he has the same equal right as us, as women. So, and they, both of them are legitimate. Both man and Satan are legitimate. Mm -hmm. So we can, God, we can only invite God to come and help us. We can, you know, you know, uh, use the principles of God to kind of, to def, you know, reduce the influence of Satan. But God cannot get rid of him until the time of the lease. Or that God has you know, for, for the earth that God gave to man is over. So let's say God gives you uh, let's let's take let's take an apartment for example. Mm -hmm. Let's say your parents yeah. gave you an apartment, and that apartment was given to you for ten years, mm -hmm. and you went and brought a homeless man into that apartment, and you are living there with him. So you are living there, there and the person has a contract. Mm -hmm. To be in that house as long as that lease continues with you because you have given him your authority and that uh, contract cannot be signed you know cannot be stopped because you gave you you are the owner even though your parents who gave you the apartment will say what have you done why did you let this woman come come and you said oh, i'm sorry dad he signed the contract mm. so only when the 10 years lease that your parents gave you that apartment for is over then god could say now the time is over not just for for the for the homeless man but for you since it's over for you it's over for the homeless man too but for the meantime you people have to manage now if you want god or your parents to interfere in the affairs of what's going on in that apartment you've got to invite them to come in mm -hmm. so it that's the way the same way we men have to invite god that's why we pray we bring God through prayers to come and interfere in our fears. And then we could also uh, influence, you could in, use some other ways to limit the, the, the effects of Satan on, in that apartment. That is, if you know the mind of God and his ways and his principles, you could apply them to reduce the influence of 
Satan on the earth. And also, you could, you know, you know, you live by the principles of the kingdom to try to limit, but still, mm -hmm. he has the right to be in that apartment. So Satan is still here, and he's going to be wrecking havoc. So the only people who could stop or limit some of these evil things that are happening on the earth is man. It is the man that has authority over the earth with Satan. So if you change the heart of man, men will stop doing evil. If we, we are the only ones who, who can talk to our fellow men. God doesn't have flesh here. The flesh of God is me. The body of God is me. And the people who are doing the wars and killing the people, they are human beings like me. I am the one to go. I must fill myself with God's reality, with God's presence, and I must take the truth of the gospel of love to those people who are killing and doing the war. So, you know, God could empower me, God could, you know, uh, strengthen me to do that, but I still want, only man has the ultimate say in a lot of things that are happening. Mm -hmm. uh, that, yes, God is, God is sovereign, God is almighty, God might be able to interfere one way or the other one time, but normally after man has prayed and after man has called upon him. And, uh, and God would not just go against his, his rules. If he had ruled that the least of men would be for a certain period of time, he would not come and just break. It's not an unjust God. It's not an unruly God that will just come and do, change the order or the arrangement easily like that. Mm -hmm. You know, so he will honor even his own word when it's not in his favor as well. So he will only strengthen us so that we will be more powerful and take more responsibility for the earth and we will know we are in church. He said the heavens he give he gave to God. I mean it belongs to God belongs to God. But the earth he gave to the sons of men. He gave us the authority to manage the earth for him. The earth was created for man, not for God. He said he let us create man in our own image that they might rule and have dominion and manage the earth for him. So it's our responsibility to manage the earth, to rule the earth. So most of the things that are wrong here, we are just blaming God for nothing. We should not be blaming God for most of the things happening here. We should blame it ourselves. We should be blaming ourselves. If everyone in the church today take responsibility for their own sphere of life and bring the gospel of love and the kingdom to every sphere of life, we will see drastically that the evil on the earth has reduced. So it's all about us doing taking something. responsibility yes taking responsibility and to become something. managers of the earth mm -hmm. and for us to bring the kingdom and so every spell of the to earth. stop killings and yes everything. yes mm -hmm. so as far as the church will be relevant to the society in the way that we will reduce evil we will reduce evil yes. and we will start stop most of the crimes yes. and most of the horrible yeah, things yes right? Yes. But what we want is that we want to sit down in our churches, do nothing, and ask God to come and do it. God will not do for us what he has asked us to do. We have to do what he has asked us to do. God will not do what man is supposed to do. And man cannot do what God is supposed to do. We, he will not do for us what we are supposed to do for ourselves. I'm sorry. Pastor, do you believe in prayer? What is, then what is the role of the, of the prayer? Are we the ones who are trying to put prayers like in the center of everything and, and just go like, okay, we will pray and everything will work out for us? Yes, that is a wrong notion of prayer. Prayer is not about asking God to come and do everything for us Why we just ask. Mm -hmm. Prayer is about strengthening first of all the first thing prayer is about is about strengthening our relationship with god so i pray to strengthen my relationship with god i pray to discover god more mm -hmm. i pray to know his qualities and have his qualities so that i will be able to function like him more i pray so that his image will be reflected in me the more so that people on earth will see me see him through mm -hmm. seeing me. I pray so that I could be his image. I could be him on the earth. I pray so that his presence, his power, his spirit will be more in me. It will be, God will be bigger in me. When he's bigger in me, I'll be able to function more like him on the earth. Mm -hmm. That's the primary purpose of prayer. So it's not that I'm praying that he will come while I re remove myself and he just comes and does everything. No, I pray first of all so that he's really, he will come to me. He will come and become bigger in me. 
then I go in the physical realm to act for him. I also pray to know his will mm -hmm. and his desires so that when I know his will and desires, I go and accomplish it. I go or I pray also so that I will be filled with his strength and power so that I will use that strength and power to do his will and carry out his will on the earth. Mm -hmm. So I pray so that he will strengthen me. He will give me the grace. He will give me the understanding. He will give me the, the, the inspiration to go and do what he wanted to do on earth. So mm -hmm. when he says, let your will be done on earth as it is in yeah. heaven, he's not saying you just ask that and mm -hmm. the angels will come and fix it. No, mm -hmm. I'm asking that he will do that through me. Man is his instrument on the earth. Mm -hmm. He created us for that that he, we are his representatives we take him to places we he uses us and we want him to use us to accomplish his will and purpose on earth you know the bible says many times that uh i, lo I am looking for man mm -hmm. i i am looking for man who will stand in the gap yes. i am looking for man who i will send god is always looking for man on the earth god needs man on the earth and without man uh even god will be limited on the earth God needs us. We are his feet. We are his hands. We are his mouth. He needs us without us. God wants to help us, but he will not be able to do it. Not that he cannot do it because he's all omnipresent, uh, omnipresent, but that will be exceptions. So he's not going to work on exceptions and miracles all the time. He wants to use his representatives, his children that are already here. He needs us. So it means that God is responsible for the spiritual part, but we're responsible for the one yes. for the physical yes. over here, the yes. physical work on yes. earth. You see now. And I'm so sorry that most people just think prayer means, you know, let God come and fix it, and I don't have anything to do. I just ask, mm -hmm. and that's what people have been doing. And because they're just expecting God to act, why they do nothing. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of things have not been done, and the you know the earth has been suffering. The kingdom has been has not progressed the way it's supposed to, because people are thinking God Himself will come and fix it. Then why, why does He need us? He would. He doesn't need us even. If He could have done he, it himself. himself, yes. Mm -hmm. We have the legitimate right here, and we can. Uh, we, we just need to find out his will and do it for, in it for him and on his behalf, on his behalf, sorry. Mm -hmm. Last week, in the States, where there are uh, now it's primaries, the people are voting for the next president, or at least for the candidate out of the parties, and uh, some of the pastors in the States, they laid hands on Hillary Clinton, one of the candidates, frontrunner from the Democrat Party, um, praying for God's favor that will be on her. Actually, do you believe in that kind of prayer, that someone will pray over God's favor on a particular person? So it's not the people who are choosing, but God, you should take a look at that person and you should choose this one. No, I think it's not, it's more, that kind of prayer is not as such um, an act of asking God to choose Hillary Clinton mm -hmm. or Donald Trump. I think when they pray for a candidate like that, what they are actually they are actually doing that not for God to act, but for it's an it's a, it's a statement, it's a political statement to people. Mm -hmm. So when Hillary Clinton goes to pastors that pastors should pray for him, it's a statement that he she is making that I belong to your camp. That mm -hmm. you Christians think I'm not a believer and I don't believe in God or I'm against you. No. See, I've come to submit myself mm -hmm. to pastors. And uh, so people who support and respect those pastors will now support her. Mm -hmm. So I don't think they're trying to manipulate the hands of God. Even if you listen to carefully to those prayers, people are not saying God make her the president. Mm -hmm. People are saying your will should be done. And, you know, actually Donald Trump did the same thing a few months ago. He also went to some pastors that pastors should pray for, for, for him to, to, you know, to bless him. So it's a prayer of blessing mm -hmm. rather than a prayer of installation. And if you ask me, I'm sure many of my American friends will not understand this. 
and they will say this is crazy pastor sunday cannot be saying this especially the evangelic my evangelical friends in america i am so surprised that many of these evangelical friends are uh, supporting donald trump i think that a lot of people in the democratic uh, in the in the uh, republican party are more dedicated christians the lady, there is a lady there, I forgot her name now, she was in the computer industry. But she, Carly. Huh? Carly. Yeah, but she she's, a, she's a believer. HP. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. She's, a, she's a more serious believer, I would think. And um, then the former governor, uh, Akabe or something, of tech, uh, I think Kansas or something, he's a more serious believer as well. And, um, you know, Carlson, uh, you know, he's a believer. Those are very serious believers. But you know, maybe, maybe they will not support them because maybe they will not win. They are, they don't, they are not their front runners. Mm -hmm. But if to choose between uh, uh, Hillary Clinton from Democratic Party and uh, Donald Trump, I don't know Donald Trump. But from what I've heard him speak and what he has, uh, the way he have, you know, what I've listened to, I don't think he's such a serious believer as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and. I personally know for sure, this is a personal knowledge that this is what will shock my friends now mm -hmm. and Christians in America, is that I believe that Hillary Clinton is a better Christian than uh, Donald Trump. Now, a lot of people will just think that is a curse word okay, right yes. there. <laughs> and many people are ready to deny me and stone mm -hmm. me right there. But I, I have met her personally. Mm -hmm. I know her. And, uh, and I know some, the person who, who is mentoring her. And the person is a pastor, a very, um, a very credible pastor, a man of God for sure. He's a Pentecostal pastor. And the person is doing uh, home, gr home groups with her, uh, Bible study with her, and mentoring her. Uh, you know, I don't want to say she has prayed the prayer of salvation because many people do that. But what people look at, they will say, okay, let's, let's, what's her fruits? If, if a Christian is mentoring her or mm -hmm. a pastor is mentoring her, why does she support abortion? Why does she support yes. uh, gay marriage? And, but that is where politics comes in. The same thing with Obama, you see. Yes. You know, so people will say, he's not a Christian, he's a Muslim. Why does he support gay? Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and also, I know a pastor who says uh, Obama is not Muslim, that he's more a Christian than a Muslim. So the same thing I will say about Hillary Clinton, that he is more, she is more, sorry, a Christian than Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but, you know, it's not my choice, it's not my choice, it's not my pick. I'm not going to choose, I'm not going to vote in America, let Americans decide their destiny. But if it was up to you, you would go with Clear, uh, Clinton, right? Uh, I don't know yet. I, I'm just saying. Uh, I'm just saying she is more a Christian than Donald Trump. Maybe I will vote for Donald Trump because uh, he's pragmatic mm -hmm. and he's untraditional. He's uh, uh, in the sense that uh, he's, uh, he's a businessman. I like the fact that. Uh, is you no know, thinking in a different way, in a fresh way. Mm -hmm. But I think he's erratic as well. So maybe I would not vote for him because of his being him being erratic. But uh, with uh, Hillary Clinton, you know what to expect. She's more predictable, mm -hmm. and I think she might, might become a better president. What about Cruz? He's now the Cruz, front runner. Yeah, Cruz. Yeah, I think most Christians will probably support Cruz. Uh, I don't know if she is born again or not, but maybe it's, I, I, I don't have much information about him. But, but still, he does not support abortion. He is against uh, gay uh, marriages. Gay, yeah, yeah, so that will really entice him to the evangelicals. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I think when it comes to politics in America, uh, gay marriage and abortion, that is what the Christians use as, a, as uh, parameters mm -hmm. to vote for who president or not. But that, those are not the only two questions on the ballot box. There are a lot of other issues that make you a good or bad president. Like uh, Jimmy Carter, mm -hmm. he, he, he was a Christian and maybe he was not supporting abortion and gay marriage that time. But he was not a very good Christian or, the, or you know, a very good uh, president overall. Mm -hmm. So those two questions don't determine if you're going to be a good, a good uh, president or not. Like, uh, you President Bush, uh, he was against those things. 
but he could even though he was against gay and abortion but he couldn't change it he couldn't enforce it upon the his opinion his position upon the country immediately he went away obama came and enforced his own position of gay and abortion upon the country it's a pity that even though being a christian doesn't mean he was going to, he's going to overturn everything because not even the president decides everything in america a lot depends on the judiciary as well but obama has, has been able to get the judiciary to do what he wants but Bush was not able to get the, 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 the judiciary to change the law, the, the law about abortion and, uh, and gay marriage, to prohibit them. That's what the Christians want. So, you know, you don't really know. You don't really know. You know, you've got to look at the candidate from every direction, from all sides. Yeah. But Obama, uh, during the, his first term, he did not support abortions or gay marriages. He started supporting it when he was, uh, he, tr uh, he became the candidate out of the Democratic Party for the second term that, that he was running. So, and you said that... I think he always supported them, but he didn't push for it as hard, mm -hmm. maybe in the first term. Uh, but anybody that comes from on the Democratic ticket, will support because that is their party agenda. Yes. They don't have any option really. Mm -hmm. They they have to because they need an a, a, they need electorates. And those electorates are the people who voted for them because that is their their campaigning ground. Those are the people they are wooing to vote for them. That's how they want. So and Clinton they promised them. Clinton might be supporting such controversial topics yes. in in order to get votes, but she is a Christian herself. She, yeah, example. but you know, even Abosh, even Obama do, mm -hmm. does not individually support gay or abosh, abortion. That's what he says himself. He says that as a person, he will not be a gay or support gay marriage, mm -hmm. and as an individual, and as an individual, he will not uh, probably you know, do uh, abortion. Mm -hmm. But he says that he will support choice. That's what they say. The right of people to choose. So if anybody wants to be gay, they want, he said, I will give him that right to choose, either to be gay or not. And if anybody wants to do abortion as a woman, they think it's a woman's right, that I will give her the right to choose, either to do abortion or not to do abortion. That's the way they understand it. A little bit different from the way we understand it. Mm -hmm. The way we understand it is that uh, if you are a Christian, you will actually uh, prohibit abortion. You will prohibit gay marriage. Mm -hmm. But they look at it as politicians, and politicians try to maneuver their way through, you know, just to get the, to the to the place. See, our show is coming to a, uh, to an end. In so fast. <laughs> yes, it's so fast. So many questions, so many topics. To and we're not getting them to them, right? No. Uh, Let's do a quick one. Yeah, we will do the quick one. But before, um, we would like to address one of the thing to uh, like a question to our viewers. Please let us know where you are actually watching us from, because we would like to recognize you. And please, if you've listened to some probably previous episodes and this episode in particular, and you have something to add, or you would like to thank Pastor or share your views on this program and this show, whether it's helping you, so please submit those things, your country, where you're watching us from, and also probably your endorsement of the program, just put it in the comment section whether it's on YouTube or Facebook, and we will do the quick questions. Um, first off, going a little bit back um, to, to the start of our conversation when we've discussed the kingdom, uh, dream and life basically, and the gospel of the kingdom. One uh, person asks, can a Christian work in a nightclub because he feels called to be the light in the darkness? Oh there? yeah, we Christians must go there to work. That's my opinion. We have a fortnight and evening of uh, outreach evening mm -hmm. where yeah, I will come and preach, uh, other people will come and give testimony. And <laughs> at a point, half of our choir coming from those prostitutes, coming from the casino. That's a good business for the kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> Not business for money, but mm -hmm. to bring more people. Because when the, the owner of the casino says, well, everybody, all the prostitutes, they will gather them and get, put the pastor in front of them. And those people are already desperate. Mm -hmm. they, are, they, are, they are on drugs, they are drinking. They are already desperate. But when they get to here, they become some of the most zealous people in the church. 
So I think if God is leading him there, and if he is uh, confident of his uh, of his faith, of his you know, if he knows he can survive it, mm -hmm. if if he has enough light in him, oh yeah, we should be going to do where the darkness are. Uh, uh, not we shouldn't be running away from darkness. The mm -hmm. darkness should be running away from the light. We are the light. Let the darkness run away from us, not we running away from that. Isn't the same with, for example, prostitutes? And some, uh, someone feels Don't go that practice prostitution. No, no, but <laughs> still practice the deliverance of, yes, of the prostitution. Yes, yeah, go to our minister to them. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question. Um, I've been experiencing stagnation um, and financial difficulties. What are the ways out? This all week, this all week. Like the uh, uh, a whole week, I was talking about the loss of money. Just go read those articles. If you don't find them on my Facebook, go find them on my blog, sundadelajablog.com. Yeah, or go get my book, Money Won't Make You Rich. That is, that it will answer all your financial questions. Can someone claim to have Holy Spirit and still be lacking good things? Oh yeah, of course. A lot of people have Holy Spirit lack like good things because, like I said. Money, for you to have good things in life, you need money. And money don't, doesn't come to you because you're a Christian. Money doesn't come to you because you're a good person. Money doesn't come to you because you, you go to church or because you're a good person. Money comes to you just because, because you know the loss of money. Money doesn't know, it doesn't care if you're a bad person or a good person. Money only comes to people who understand the way the, money, the law works and who know how to apply the laws. Mm -hmm. um... In 1 Corinthians uh, 6, 9, it is written, The adulterers shall not enter the kingdom of God. Does this mean born-again Christians that have remained and established a family life with children should divorce? I, uh, I don't think... Would you understand it? Can you explain it to me? Mm, I guess, yes. If someone committed adultery prior to the marriage and, um, and, they, and then they got married together... Okay. No, I do realize that. I think if God was yeah. married and divorced and remarried and now having uh, having a family a with, family with, with children, kids, yeah, that's what he's talking about. Right? Yes. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't. Uh, it depends on the situation. Mm -hmm. It will be very wrong for me to give a blanket answer to this question because it's not very clear. I would have liked the person to write it again and to make it more uh, elaborate. Yes. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit is meant to guide people. Why do people with, with the Holy Spirit still commit sins? <laughs> Everybody is going to commit sin before they die. As long as you are on the earth, as long as you are flesh, as long as you are a human being, you are going to commit sin. We shouldn't be deceiving ourselves, telling people that if they are Christian, they don't commit sin. I will for sin either in our thoughts or in our actions, but it's not, the sin is not a big deal. The big deal is that Jesus died for our sins. He, 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 he brought us back to the Father. We have a relationship with the Father right now. And then if the sin we do, we should just confess that sin and keep on pursuing God. You know, we are going to be sinning. Nobody can guarantee that you will not, never sin on the earth. We are going to sin one way or the other because we are men, not because Holy Spirit is in you or it's not in you. Holy Spirit doesn't stop sin. It's flesh and mm -hmm. your decision and your principles that you live by that stop sin. Uh, so it's, it's not you know, a question of the Holy Spirit at all. Thank you very much. And now some of the greetings people are actually reading, writing to you. Hello, Pastor. I bless God in your life. That's from Aston. Lydia writes, well done. We're watching from Kent, UK. Gabriel says, more grace, Daddy. Thank you for your life. And also people are watching us from Tanzania, Minnesota, also UK, US, Dubai, Jamaica, um, Cape Town in South Africa, and Kenya, Nigeria, and a lot of more countries. I guess not everyone wrote it, but thank you very much, Pastor. Thank Lord Jesus for your grace and mercy. Amen. And stay blessed, great man of God. May his great mercy be with you in Jesus mighty name that's from Stella so thank you very much for those and of you Stella is from where? she, she didn't, didn't say that okay. she didn't say it but still mm -hmm. she wants to bless you and she wants to know that she was watching you 
Okay. So thank you very much for those of you who's been watching us. And Pastor, could you please pray? Okay. Um, uh, if you have been watching this program, I'm happy that you're here with us. And I hope that God has ministered to you. Um, <laughs> we answered a question about prayer today <laughs> about uh, asking God to do something for us as against us acting ourselves. So I don't want to uh, pray in such a way as to make you think that, yeah, now Pastor has prayed, uh, God is going to do something for me. Yes, God will do that, but you should know that most of the time when we pray, God is expecting us to go do something afterwards. God will give you the grace, He will give you the anointing, the power, the empowerment, but also, please, go do something after that prayer. God will give you the spiritual aspect of the blessing. Go walk it out in the physical. So, Father, in Jesus' name, that person that is having headache, we command the headache to cease in Jesus' name. The person that is having the problem in the shoulder, we command it to cease. The person that is having scratches, skin disease, we command those, that skin to to, to, be, to, be, to be released in Jesus' name. That person that is praying for someone that has mental situation, we proclaim supernatural healing in Jesus' name. The person that is, go, just as we're doing this program, you went and vomit. You're vomiting. You feel like vomiting. Right now, we pray for healing for you in the name of Jesus. We release the power of God upon everyone that is watching us. And whatever you're believing God for, we, we agree with you. We ask for supernatural intervention. In the name of Jesus. The person with the ear, we proclaim healing to your ear. In Jesus' name. The person with the heart, we proclaim healing to your heart. This is in Jesus' name. The person that is having that problem in the nose, upper side of the nose, in Jesus' name, we proclaim healing to you. The person that is having deafness in 90% of your right ear, we command that ear to open in Jesus' name. Whatsoever might be the needs in the people that are washing right now, or that, got, that are going to wash afterwards, we release God's touch, God's God divine power to come upon you to your business, in your work, in your uh, family, in your health, that the visitation of God will overwhelm you, empower you to do greater things for God and his kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. And again, we would like to remind our viewers that during the week you can submit your questions to pastor at sundayadelajablog.com and next week it will be the Valentine's Day, the day of love. So we will dedicate our whole show to discussing relationships, family, love. So if you have any of those questions of those topic, so please send your questions to, again, pastor at sundaydalajablog.com or simply leave your message, your question under this video, whether you're watching us on Facebook or on Periscope or YouTube. We will see your question and we will be here live next week at 8 p.m. Kiev time sharp. So thank you very much for tuning in and God bless you.